Dear friends, I'm so pleased to join you in celebrating the 10 year anniversary of the UCLA Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. At the same time, I join you in mourning the passing of Eunice Nazarian Alava Shalom, and I share your feelings of gloss and grief. Eunice's legacy of tireless activism and remarkable support for the American Jewish community, and especially for those forced to flee religious extremism in Iran, as well as his lifelong efforts to build bridges between American and Israeli institutions, these are shining examples of the deep bond between the Jewish people and the State of Israel. Dear friends, as former opposition leader in the Israeli Knesset, as chair of the Jewish Agents for Israel, and now as president of the State of Israel, it has always been clear to me that in this modern day miracle, our beloved Jewish state, respectful debate and constructive criticisms are vital for maintaining Israel's democracy and Israel diaspora bond. A healthy debate over Israeli policies does not contradict love and loyalty to Israel. In fact, they strengthen each other, provided that the truth is being said and that it is understood that the just and noble cause of the creation of the Jewish state is beyond any debate and nobody can undermine it. Too often, however, we see that when it comes to discussions about Israel, slogans, demonization, and simple but false analogies take the place of nuanced analysis. This is especially true on many university campuses. Therefore, I was so impressed two years ago when I visited the Danzarian Center, then in my capacity as chairman of the Jewish Agency. I was deeply impressed by the high-level research and discussion of modern-day Israel promoted by the Nazarian Center, which provides an important model for Israel studies and an important model for counterweight to, uh, for attempts to delegitimize the world's only Jewish state. This is critical not only from the academic point of view, but it is critical for Israel's well-being and future. The bipartisan U.S.-Israel Strategic Alliance is truly a core element of Israel's survival and strength. It is therefore crucial that the next generation of American leaders have a full understanding of Israel's complex reality and the incredible developments in our region. And as the Abraham Accords have shown, mutual understanding, dialogue, and respect are the building blocks for the future of stability and peace in the Middle East. In my own role as the President of the State of Israel, I've already visited the United Arab Emirates, Turkey, and Jordan, and held numerous meetings with leaders from around the world about Israel and about world Jewry and about the Middle East. And I congratulate tonight's well-deserved awardees who have focused on these issues so long, for so much time, and with such great efforts. My dear friend, Sharon Nazarian, and the Rosalinda and Arthur Gilbert Foundation. Thank you all for your support of the Nazarian Center and the State of Israel. Thank you, the leaders of the center and the incredible professionals of the center, including my good friend, Professor Waxman. May you continue to go from strength to strength. Bless you all. Happy Passover, and see you in Israel, hopefully soon. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Dov Waxman, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation Chair of Israel Studies at UCLA, and the Director of the UCLA Eunice and Sarai Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. Thank you so much for joining us tonight to celebrate the 10-year anniversary of the founding of the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. We're not only celebrating this major milestone, but also the Nazarian Center's many accomplishments over the past decade, from teaching thousands of UCLA students about Israel and hosting dozens of Israeli scholars, to engaging a growing worldwide audience through programs that explore Israel in all its complexity and diversity. We have lots to celebrate, as you'll soon see in a short video about the center. We're also here tonight to honor the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation and Dr. Sharon Nazarian for their instrumental roles in the center's success. We are deeply grateful to Sharon 
and to the Gilbert Foundation's co-trustees, Richard Zyman and Marty Blank, for their commitment to the centre and to Israel studies at UCLA more broadly. We're also so grateful to everyone on our community advisory board and faculty advisory board. Thank you all. I'd also like to thank the centre's hard-working and dedicated staff, especially Maura Resnick, who has been with the centre from the beginning and whose devotion and hard work made this gala happen. Tonight, we will also pay tribute to the life and legacy of Eunice Nazarian, who recently passed away at the age of 91. The center owes its very existence to the generosity and vision of Eunice and his wife, Soraya. Thank you, Soraya. While we mourn Eunice's death, we also want to celebrate his amazing life and his many contributions to so many worthy causes, both here in the Los Angeles region and in Israel. May his memory be a blessing. Last, but by no means least, tonight we will hear from our special guest, Israeli government minister and member of Knesset, Mirav Michaeli, who has come all the way from Israel to be with us. Unfortunately, Lucy Aharish is unable to join us this evening, but we're delighted that Jody Ruderin, the editor-in-chief of The Formwood and former New York Times bureau chief in Israel, has very kindly stepped in to have this conversation with Minister Michaeli. With so much happening in Israel lately, they will certainly have lots to talk about. We are honored to have these highly accomplished women join us tonight. We're also honored to have with us this evening UCLA's Chancellor, Jean Block, and Israel's Consul General in Los Angeles, Hillel Newman. Now, without any further ado, here's a short video about the UCLA Eunice and Sarai Nazarian Center for Israel Studies. About 15 years ago, we could start telling the fact that the climate on university campuses was beginning to change when it came to the study and understanding of Israel. I knew that there was a void that needed to be filled. Coming to UCLA with this vision of creating an academic center for the study of Israel in a major public institution like UCLA was really the perfect formula of what we as a family, where we wanted to make our mark. The mission of the center was to educate students about contemporary Israel and to create a community. And I really think on both of those two top priorities, we've achieved our goals. The Nazarian Center is dedicated to promoting the study of modern Israel, both at UCLA, in the local community, and now around the world. We do that in three core areas, through our teaching, our research, and our outreach. In terms of teaching, our primary mission is to teach UCLA undergraduate students about Israel. Within the local community, we put on programs, lectures, and talks. And now, we also engage a global community through our virtual programming on Zoom to teach and educate about Israel around the world. It's a place where people can get facts and information about Israel that gives you a really candid, accurate view of life in Israel. And that's important to have that available in our community, both at UCLA and the broader LA community. What we do fundamentally is Israel education, not Israel advocacy. We're not there to try to convince people to believe a certain thing or to think a certain way. We're just trying to arm people with more information, more knowledge, and a deeper and more nuanced understanding of the country. Israel is such a divisive conversation, especially on UCLA's campus, and having this opportunity where we can have open and academic conversations and learn about Israel without bias is such a blessing because it brings diverse students into the classroom and we're able to continue on these conversations outside of the classroom as well. It approaches the question of Israel and Israel studies not from a narrow angle, of politics, or science, or water, or theater, but all of them combined. In fostering a really informative and academic understanding of Israel, I was able to understand Israel's importance in international relations in the world, and particularly the Middle East. It just has given me a lot more certainty in what I actually believe in, and it also forced me to change some of my beliefs. To watch their eyes light up when they make a connection that they hadn't thought of before, 
or to watch their shoulders fall when they encounter an idea or an experience that is challenging for them to process emotionally is really rewarding because it gives me proof that what we do really makes a difference. We host Israeli scholars, visiting faculty members. For them, it's important to come here to do their research and to meet with American undergraduate students and students from around the world. And it also exposes our students, some of the leading scholars from Israel and the kind of cutting edge research that's happening. The benefit of having visiting scholars from Israel is that we merge the theoretical and academic studies with actual experience of life in Israel. You can gain a more nuanced understanding of Israeli life when you meet someone that comes from there and when you talk about culture and society rather than just the geopolitics of the region. One of our strongest attributes is not only what happens in the classroom, it's also what happens outside in the community. I really have appreciated the conferences and symposia that the Nazarian Center has presented, both to the scholarly community here on the campus as well as the public. What we've done with the arts is there's symposia that have brought artists from Israel, professors of contemporary Israeli art, to speak about the Israeli culture through the arts, really shared the reality and the nature of Israel. We are always emphasizing that Israel Studies and the Nazarian Center isn't just a place for Jewish students to come. I'm not Jewish, I'm Catholic, and I have found that the Nazarian Center has been a really important place for me to understand and learn about Israel. I have felt so welcomed and so appreciated also. We're trying to be a place where people respect each other and are willing to hear each other and listen to differing views, sometimes views they may disagree with, in a way that's really not happening very often on most college campuses. The future of the Nazarian Center is tied to growth of the Nazarian Center. The Ros and Arthur Gilbert Foundation has committed a million dollars as a matching grant to raise a total of two million dollars to fund additional professorships so that we can provide the academic forum for these students throughout the campus. It will allow for the teaching of more classes about Israel and also will give a different perspective about Israel to students and faculty who are interested in the classes. My ambition for the center is to become the premier center for the study of Israel, not only in the U.S., but in the world. And I hope that I'll have the kind of partners and the community behind me that we can really get there, and I really have no doubt that we will. Hope you all enjoyed that video. Now, please join me in welcoming UCLA Chancellor Jean Block, who will present the first of tonight's honors, the Visionary Award. Thank you, Dove. So this is a bittersweet moment. Uh, as has been mentioned, today's milestone celebration comes along the recent passing of the patriarch of the Nazarian family. So I knew Eunice to be a deeply gentle, kind person. Um, as I mentioned recently, whenever I invited him to UCLA, even when he wasn't feeling well, he was there, uh, always positive, never complaining, really being an enormous supporter uh, and just an extraordinary individual. He had a perspective, you know, born out of his own history, heritage, and experience as an immigrant, that education is the path to stability and fulfillment and joy. And that belief is reflected in much of what Eunice helped to create, including the center which we're celebrating tonight. What started as a seed of an idea from the Nazarian family has in 10 years grown to a world-renowned home of critical inquiry, serving thousands of students and scholars, really a remarkable reach for a center that's really just 10 years old, just a little bit over 10 years old now. 
It's a hub of rigorous study of topics related to Israel, but it's by no means a place for just Israeli and Jewish students. The center helps every member of our community embrace diversity and cultivate an informed worldview. It has brought Israel to life for our students through its visiting Israeli faculty, scholars, and artists. It's provided a space for robust, fair, and level-headed discussion about complex geopolitical issues. Studying the history and policies of Israel can stir up passions, and the Nazarian Center is a home for conducting vigorous debate, but in a respectful way. I have no doubt that the Nazarian Center will continue to grow and influence the st in, in stature in the next decade. It has just really been a spectacular start. As the center expands, Eunice and Soraya's dream will be enlarged and brought to life in the thousands of students, scholars, and citizens from across the globe. Now I'm pleased to present the Eunice and Soraya Nazarian Center for Israeli Studies Visionary Award. This award is given to individuals or organizations that have uh, furthered the center's mission through its keen force, through their keen foresight, imagination, and leadership. Today, I am pleased to recognize the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation, led by its co-trustees, Martin Blank and Richard Zyman. From Israel Studies' earliest beginnings at UCLA, the Gilbert Foundation has been a key partner. The foundation endowed UCLA's chair in Israel Studies, currently held by Professor Dove Waxman. When the Nazarian Center was established, the chairholder became the director of the center. The Gilbert Foundation has also supported students studying in Israel through a Centennial Scholars Endowment, and most recently, as mentioned, provided a $1 million challenge to help bring more faculty uh, in Israel Studies to UCLA, a challenge that you're all helping meet uh, tonight. Throughout the years, the foundation and its co-trustees have been steadfast in their dedication to the Nazarian Center's success. Marty and Richard, please come up and join me to accept this award. So it's my honor to present the Nazarian Center's Visionary Award to the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation. Congratulations. So you heard my chancellor say, this is a matching gift. And uh, it doesn't have a time on it, but uh, expediency is important. Uh, I'd like to thank Sharon, Sharon Nazarian, for, from the very beginning, and for her steadfast commitment through all these years. It's actually uh, 12 years, almost 12 years. Uh, but we don't count the two during the pandemic. Um, Soroya, you and Eunice have ensured the continuing success forever of the center. And I'd like to once again applaud both of you. If the Gilberts were alive, let me back up a little. And Marty will get a little more into it, I think. But, but we do... We, the Gilbert Foundation, do about 120 significant grants a year, 30 of which are in Israel, many of which are focused on education. And we, Marty and I always ask ourselves, if Rosalind and Arthur were alive today, would they be happy with what we have done and we are doing? And to them, Israel was a serious commitment and a serious concern. Education was also a serious commitment of theirs also. Here, the Nazarian Center represents both education and Israel. And by virtue of our getting involved early in the center, we then, because of the success, initial success of the center, moved to UC Berkeley. And I'm proud to say, 
we established and also a chair at UC Berkeley. It's, I can never remember the name, it's not called the Israel Study Center, but we had to find a home, it's in the law school, so they found a form of, of an appropriate name. But the Gilberts, the Gilberts would be very proud, very proud of what we've done tonight, uh, what we've done along the way. Um, when I say this gift is matching, uh, there's a reason. Uh, we need more dollars for the center. There's students who want to be exposed to Israel and its many facets, but we don't have the professors, and they unfortunately then can't attend. So I do thank you for all your support tonight, but there's always room for more. <laughs> so give it a thought. Um, to my partner, Marty, um, He's been a partner along the way, <clears throat> and I always like to say, in all my endeavors, including business, and many of you know that's been very complex, that he's been the best partner I've ever had. And I'd now like to introduce you to Marty. I would like to uh, reinforce and repeat what Richard said. He also is the greatest partner anyone can have, not just in a business, but in a personal setting other than my wife, I think you're down there, yes. <laughs> but um, I am delighted that we can say that we participated in the founding of the uh, Nazarian Center, and Sharon, I know you're down there, I can't quite see you, but you know, there you are, great. I know this would not have happened without you and your family, and we were glad to step up when you asked and participate in the founding and the initial funding of the center and the chair. And the exciting thing is we now have a leader at the center, Dove Waxman, who is amazing. And what we're asking for now is to get a, a number two or number three and number four at the center so that there'll be more classes, uh, more things to learn about Israel and reinforce our love for Israel that we all have. So thank you very much for coming and hopefully we'll have, we will have a great dinner and we will see you later. Thank you, Richard and Marty, and thanks for the pitch for the Nazarian Center. Uh, and and uh, congratulations to the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation for its incredible vision and generosity. One of the Nazarian Center's goals has always been to foster productive discourse about Israel among UCLA students from differing backgrounds and with diverse perspectives. Since its founding, the center has reached over seven thousand students in the classroom and through in-person programming. I'd now like to invite to the stage two such students whose educational experiences at UCLA have been deeply impacted by the Nazarian Center. Please welcome the Rosalind and Abner Goldstein undergraduate fellows, Chloe Levian and Natala, Natalia Urena Tregulis, who will be presenting the Center's Legacy Award. The YNS Nazarian Center Legacy Award was created especially to recognize Sharon Nazarian for her unparalleled role in the founding of the Nazarian Center and her unwavering commitment to the center's mission of education and scholarship and her outstanding efforts on its behalf. Speaking as a Nazarian Center undergraduate fellow, I can truly say that there exists no one more fitting for this award than Sharon. Your dedication to the center and its incredible successes are inspiring to us all. Sharon, on behalf of all the UCLA students who have benefited and will benefit from the Nazarian Center's incredible and necessary work, we want to thank you for all that you have done to ensure the Center's success. The YNS Nazarian Center has deeply impacted our educational careers and plays an instrumental role in the UCLA community. UCLA is a better university because of the YNS Nazarian Center, and we are so grateful to you and honored to present you with this award.
Thank you all for this really unbelievable honor. I really, it takes my breath away. And as you've already heard, there's lots of mixed emotions here tonight. The name of my father's first infrastructure company in Iran was Polban. My father was a trailblazer in many ways throughout his life. But as a Jewish Iranian born in the ghettos of Tehran, venturing into this sector and getting government contracts to build bridges and roads and dams was really no small feat. It meant breaking all sorts of barriers. But when it was even more poignant now, looking back, is the name he selected for his company. Polban literally means bridge builder in Farsi. He built actual bridges, but went on to build bridges between people, communities, and countries, making this act a hallmark of his life and his legacy. Today, the Nazarian Center can also be seen as an act of bridge building, one of bringing together Americans and Israelis, as you've heard, in the pursuit of understanding and knowledge. So my father's legacy, less than a month since his passing, is front and center here tonight for all of us to witness. It resides in the center, in the center we celebrate tonight. It also resides in me. This honoring tonight, which I'm so privileged to get, serves as a testament to the strong bridges my father has built, connecting generations of Nazarians to both the love of Israel and the pursuit of academic excellence. The very first time the idea of Israel Studies program entered my mind coincided with the Battle of Jenin in 2002 during the Second Intifada. If you remember, when Israeli soldiers entered the Jenin refugee camp to arrest those responsible for terror attacks against civilians, senior Palestinian officials at that time accused Israel of committing an act of genocide against Palestinian refugees, killing thousands, snatching bodies, burning, uh, burying them in mass graves, all claims that were not factual and meant to manipulate world opinion. Subsequent investigations later confirmed by both Israeli and Palestinian sources found that 52 Palestinians, mostly gunmen, and 23 IDF soldiers were killed in the fighting. This was not a mere act of spreading disinformation, but a foretelling of what was to come, a global understanding of the cost of manipulation of truth. It, it served as a watershed moment for Israel and for the Palestinian people, and maybe for the world. But for me personally, it was a moment of awakening. Today, we clearly understand the threat such misinformation campaigns pose to our society to our democracy, in fact. When Russian atrocities in Ukraine are covered up, or when scientific knowledge about the COVID virus and vaccines are questioned, that is an outright attack on the health of our democracy. So it was that personal awakening that led me to the idea of establishing an Israel Studies program, a fact-based academic center, teaching critical thinking, scholarly analysis from a multidisciplinary perspective. That watershed moment also brought me to where I am today, serving as a senior vice president for international affairs at the Anti-Defamation League, the revered anti-hate organization. And I'm so thrilled that our CEO, Jonathan Greenblatt, and his lovely wife, Marjan Greenblatt, flew all the way from New York to be with us tonight. I thank them for that. So in my post at ADL, I'm literally at the forefront of fighting hate speech, disinformation, and misinformation every single day, including the delegitimization of Israel on the world stage that Professor Waxman referenced. So tonight, I stand here on the shoulders of those who provided the building blocks of this beautiful and impactful center. Like a bridge without a strong foundation and solid pillars, no entity can stand the forces it encounters. So without the leadership and vision of then Chancellor Albert Carnesal, who is here with us tonight with his lovely wife, Robin, who is also a member of our advisory board, we wouldn't be here tonight. We thank them both for their leadership. Thank you.
it must be said that that time, the creation of the Israel Studies programs was not without a controversies and need for courage. When I first brought the idea of establishing a small program at UCLA, I remember seeing letters sent to the chancellor accusing the wealthy Jewish Zionist community of attempting to impose biased academic teaching at UCLA. Not only did UCLA leadership show courage, but today, we're proud of the multiplicity of voices represented at the center. Arab academics and students, diversity of political perspective, and commitment to the scholarly mission of the center rather than advocacy, as Dov mentioned to you already. It was none other than then Foreign Minister Shimon Peres' visit to UCLA in 2003 that served as the launching pad for the Israeli Studies Program that would officially be founded in 2005, the first of its kind in the West Coast. Our founding professor, Professor Neil Natanel, is here with us tonight, and we thank him for his leadership. <laughs> Strong partners are another pivotal pillar which allow for sustained growth. So in 2006, as you heard, the Rosalind and Arthur Gilbert Foundation named the first chair in Israel studies. The Gilbert Foundation is honored tonight not only for the significant and invaluable gifts the foundation has provided the center, but also for the partnership that Richard and Marty have offered every step of the way since 2006. As thought partners, as advocates, and as stalwart defenders of the study of Israel on campus, I want to personally congratulate the foundation staff and specifically Richard and Marty for their, this well-deserved honor and for your partnership all along. Thank you. <laughs> and it was under the leadership of Chancellor Block in 2010 that the Yunus and Soraya Nazarian Center for Israel Studies was officially named. The Nazarian gift established an endowment that would ensure the center's pro program in perpetuity. Thank you, Char Chancellor Block, for your leadership. We appreciate everything you've done for the center since. <laughs> and of course, without community, no entity can survive alone. Our center director, Professor Waxman, our faculty and faculty advisors who are here tonight, and I want to mention Professor Carol Bacos, Cal Rastiella, Yoram Cohen, so many. They are at the heart of the center and they make it tick every day. Thank you for all of you and every work that you do in the classroom, outside the classroom, every single day. Thank you. Our community advisory board, many of whom are here tonight, I'm not going to mention all of you have been instrumental in making not only the center tick, but also this evening, this beautiful gala, uh, they are responsible for. And I want to personally thank Maura Resnick and our staff for this beautiful evening as well. They've worked very hard for it. So tonight, I want to end with the word that is very important to our family. And that is the word family itself. If you could please scroll down, thank you. The raison d'etre of this center um, is, of course, our amazing students, including the two who just presented me, Chloe and Natalia. It's for you and the generation of students to come that we're all gathered here tonight. And so we hope that what we've built will endure and will continue to give a wonderful future to all who want to learn about Israel. So really speaking about the final building block, I can't end my comments without addressing the most important one, and that is family. My husband, Fernando, who entered my life and we just celebrated our fifth anniversary this weekend, is the very, my own pillar that I couldn't stand here without his love and support. My three beautiful children, Sarah, Layla, who's here with us tonight, and Adam, and my eight nieces and nephews, my first grandnephew, Lev, they represent the continuation of my father's legacy and the passing down of the, his values, la dor vador, from generation to generation. My siblings, David, Shulamit, and Sam, and their wonderful spouses and partners, Angela, Matt, and Amina, I want to thank them for their immense pride in our center and their deep appreciation for how impactful our work has been and continues to be. And last but not least, 
my parents, Soraya and Eunice, the namesake of the center. You've heard me reference my father as the bridge builder. I would say that my mother, Soraya, is the creator, the one who can envision beauty in the block of stone. Without their investment, without their support, without their love, neither I nor the center would be possible. So thank you so very much to all of you. Thank you. Nazarian, a name etched on buildings, found on numerous boards of directors, and synonymous with success. Always, I say to my grandchildren, you want to have a good name. The impact they have had has truly been felt around the world. When you're honest, when you respect others, you support, you help without any condition, and they respect you people. He's a man who builds fortunes from hard work and integrity. Probably one of the most hardworking people that I've met. Whose fearless ambition helped him rise up from poverty to become a captain of industry. Never afraid to take a risk. I cannot call risk because that's the only way we have to do it. His achievements are many, a name associated with triumph. Eunice Nazarian's story is unique. As a Persian Jew, he broke through many barriers. His visionary outlook on life led him to become a working class hero whose hard earned success was born out of a never say die spirit. It was his bold vision that saw the family through troubled times, through revolutions, losses, and daunting times of uncertainty. In how my father talks about it and that I think affected him in his future, you know, growth and understanding is that how you capture and get over your fears and how fears could hold you back or coming um, overcoming it can allow you to grow. That spirit was formed in a South Tehran ghetto where his single mother known as Ima worked hard to raise her two boys. Vicious anti-Semitism was status quo and Eunice had much to overcome. He lost his father when he was two years old and raised in a very, very poor family. But he was always optimistic. Always he was someone that believed that tomorrow is better than today. In 1949, he made his way to Israel, pretending to be an Iraqi refugee. He was smuggled out of Iran only a year after the state of Israel was born. He joined his brother in carving out a new life. The immigrants arriving today come from different parts of the world. Many of them are young, and all of them share the belief that by working together they can make Israel into a strong nation. He credits joining the army, where he served as a border police officer, for adding to his solid foundation in life. He's a very good teacher for me. As much as the brothers loved Israel, both Yunus and Parvis saw newfound opportunities in Iran and set out to return to their country of birth to build multiple businesses. It was here he was to meet his future bride, Soraya. The big success I have after returning from Iran is the four children and the very lovely wife. He was very different than the, among the Iranian uh, guys in, the, in Iran, mm, more respectable and uh, open-minded and he looks very much the ideal and good person for me. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that it was very different and very uh, kind of the person that I can enjoy to share my life with him. With the stability he achieved through hard-earned financial success, Eunice now had everything he dreamed of, a family of his own, a life built with Soraya. As the Nazarian name became synonymous with success, fate would once again intervene. The Islamic Revolution toppled the Shah and brought Ayatollah Khomeini to power in 1979. 
The tensions leading up to a revolution in Iran resulted in losing nearly everything they'd built, as the Nazarian family sought refuge first in Israel and then in America. From poverty and persecution to salvation found in two countries, Israel and America, to a name he built that's now synonymous with success. Yunus Nazarian says his greatest joy now, sharing his success. Very quickly became very clear to me that this really, in a way, is the chapter that he cares the most about. This is what he chose to leave behind, the legacy. Um, and the character came through there too. It's, as we all know, very rare for men who come from abject poverty, not having a father, having really a difficult life story, to reach a point where they're li in their lives where they feel that their generosity is really their legacy. Ever the builder, libraries and dance centers have been created. Their generosity to the underprivileged is renowned, and millions in grants have been given. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Nazaria, your special focus on libraries is a clear statement of your desire to promote wisdom. So important when you donate Unconditioned, and you make other people happy, make you happy. So everything he does in Israel for the thousands of students who receive scholarships from us, from all the after-school programs that we've supported in, in uh, needy neighborhoods, all the libraries that we've built, he understands that that's not touching one life or two lives. It's really touching thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. These honors have earned Nazarian honorary doctorates from the University of Haifa and Cal State University, Northridge. In recognition of Mr. Nazarian's outstanding work to advance the arts and education, the Board of Trustees of the California State University and California State University, Northridge, are proud to confer upon Mr. Nazarian the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. His stature is further recognized with a seat on multiple board of directors globally. A humble man by nature, Eunice concedes that he takes great pride in two honors in particular. Among them, an invitation to the Israel torchlighting ceremony in Neset. Eunice was among 12 recipients invited to stand atop Mount Herzl in Jerusalem in 2009 to honor the solemn day of remembrance for Israelis fallen, a particularly memorable and rare honor for a non-Israeli native, an honor that speaks volumes to his commitment to the state of Israel. And just two years later, in 2011, Eunice was awarded the Ellis Island Medal of Honor, among the nation's most prestigious awards. His legacy of making sure that all of us, we work hard, have a good name, and making sure that you share your blessing with others. The depth of the love that this family has for, for one another, for the community, for friends, for extended family, for Israel, it's an unconditional love, and, and, and you feel that immediately when you walk through the doors. The sense of responsibility that he had towards his mother, towards his brother, towards his nation, is is something that I admire so much, that at a very young age, everything that you did was, uh, was had meaning. It, you really dedicated your life towards building a family, supporting your family, and supporting uh, Israel. Being raised the way he was raised and having nothing to where we are today, and you have to swing for the fences sometimes. Uh, so I think that's, that's what ultimately um, allows you to grow as a human being. And it's not just in business, it's in philanthropy, whether it's in your community, whether it's part of the political aspect. Um, you have to dream big, and that's something he always uh, instilled in all of us.
what a tremendous life Eunice Nazarian led and what a legacy he has left. We are truly honored to carry his name. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest speaker, member of Knesset and government minister, Murav Mikhaeli. Minister Mikhaeli has been a member of the Knesset since 2013, and in January 2021, she was elected leader of the Israeli Labour Party, breathing new life into the party and enabling it to join the current coalition government. She serves as Israel's Minister of Transportation and Road Safety, is a member of the Security Cabinet, and is the head of the Knesset's Gender Equality Cabinet, which she established. For the past two decades, Minister Mikhaeli has worked tirelessly to promote women's rights, as well as the rights of minorities, labor rights, and the peace process. She has been ranked as one of the most prolific and socially oriented legislators. Joining her for this conversation is my good friend, Jody Ruduin. Since 2019, she has been the editor-in-chief of the Forward newspaper, which celebrates its 125th anniversary this year. Before that, she spent more than two decades as a reporter and editor at the New York Times. At the Times, Jody served as Jerusalem bureau chief from 2012 to 2015, covering two Israeli elections and two wars in Gaza. Please join me in welcoming Moav Mikhaeli and Jody Rodwin. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, what a beautiful, amazing, and moving, and exciting evening. And thank you to the Nazarian family. My heart is with you so much, thinking about Eunice. Such a great Zionist with a devotion for the family, for the Jewish people, for the state of Israel, for culture, for education. I know that you know of all the great enterprises that he was leading and involved with. And it's amazing that you are holding this event tonight so soon after he's gone. And his commemoration here is really an honor to be a part of. Thank you. I'm very impressed. It's three in the morning where you're from, so. I don't know, I slept through the flight. Oh, good. I mean, listen, I am now a minister in the government, a head of a party, and a mother for a seven and a half year old, um, sorry, seven and a half <laughs> months old. Don't rush it Who so much. sleeps through the night. <laughs> he Mazzato. does sleep Mazzato. through the night. But I had an opportunity of 15 hours on a plane alone. <laughs> <laughs> Please. You're like, any, anybody who wants her, just invite her. She will come. Yeah. By all means. Anywhere. Well, it's great to be here with you, Minister and Michaeli. You, I, at the risk of damning with faint praise, you are one of my very favorite Israeli politicians. So I'm thrilled to be in this conversation with you. And of course, we're having this conversation at such a inauspicious time, or auspicious time. I mean, so much news in Israel. I want to start with the the terror attacks that have been plaguing the country for the last two weeks or so, most recently in your neighborhood on Dizengoff Street in Tel Aviv. This is, of course, any journalist who covers um, that region, there's a cycle, there are these cycles, and then we ask, is this the third intifada? What does it mean? And I just give us your, you were there, you're living through this, how is this different from all other terror waves, or is it, or what, what, is, what is your feeling? What is the feeling of the people that you just left? What do you think is going on? You're asking how is this different, and I'm thinking about Tolstoy and the, the, you know, the sentence that opens Anna Karenina. And I was I thinking of the Haggadah, but Anna Karenina is fine. Oh, yeah. 
Um, and it's, it's so difficult that we sh we're still living through terror waves and that Israel still has to fight for its mere security. Um, and at the same time, it means that we have some sort of basic resilience in front of this. So on one hand, yes, people are, you can see the, the morning after the Dizengoff attack, uh, which was like, it's so close to my house, and you know, you're sitting at home in late evening, and you hear the sirens and the choppers, and it's like all around you and everybody that you know, everyone's calling everyone, are you okay, are you okay, where are you, where are you? And then the next morning you see people are less going out. There's less traffic on the streets. But it'll take a few days and everything will go back to normal because there is a very deep resilience to it. To the people, to the society, to the state of Israel. And as a leader and as a politician, I always feel that we, it's up to us to live up to the credit that the citizens of Israel are giving the state of Israel, the way they are holding everything together all the time. It doesn't matter if they are practically saving, serving in the army or whatever other you know, forces or services of security, or if they are just, I don't know, teaching or, or doing the medical stuff or, or the social services or whatever it is. But they are the heart and soul of the country and we need to find a way to better the way Israel handles itself. So in the future, we do not have more terror attacks. And so I, you know that this is one of the strongest things that I believe in and one of the main things that keep me going in this job of politics. I believe it's possible. I think the Abram Accords is yet another proof that there is another possibility of how Israel can conduct itself with Arab countries and with its neighbors. And I am so, committed to making this happen also with our closer neighbors, not only those who are further from us. I'm going to get back to that, but I want to start, you talked about the government and the politicians living up to the resilience and the commitment of the people. And of course, last week we saw an interesting example of this when, you know, a lot of us, a lot of analysts did not think that this change government that you're part of would make it even 100 days or would pass a budget, but it has surprised everybody. And now it's on the brink of falling apart over a dispute over whether you can bring non-kosher food into hospitals on Passover. So um, tell us, I mean, there's a, a lot of, I love how much everybody talked in the, in the, about the Nazarian Center about the nuance and the, so we're going to get a little bit into the details, but I mean, what's going to happen? What do you think should happen? Is, this, is Netanyahu potentially coming back to be prime minister again? Will we have, you know, Dove introduced me with my old bio that emphasizes that I covered two elections in two years. Now you have elections <laughs> like every few months there, so it's no big deal. Are we going to see a fifth election? Ma <laughs> Okay, so which, and which question do you want me to answer first? <laughs> That's a good question. Are you going to be Prime Minister? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but not next year. Like before, we need to maintain this government. How can you maintain this government if you don't have the votes? First, let's um, establish, if this is not clear yet, how historically important this government is. And that is for a few reasons. One is that it stopped an ongoing crisis, a crazy, crazy, horrible crisis in Israeli politics, and also it saved Israel from a threat to its democracy. Secondly, because it's a kind of government that we never had. It's not that you have one big 
party and then maybe some affiliates, but it's eight different parties that came together to create a coalition. And then, and it's a, it's a very diverse coalition, right, left, secular, uh, religious, and for the first time ever, a coalition that has an Arab party in it, which it's high time that it had happened. So it's really a very important government, even though it still isn't the government that labor is forming as it will when it goes back to being a ruling party. No, uh, the one I'm forming in my vision to bring Israel back to the, the Zionist um, path that we promised ourselves in the Declaration of Independence. This, the one that Yitzhak Rabin was taking Israel back to and that labor in, is now taking back into the Rabin path and the Declaration of Independence of the State of Israel. This is the government that we will have. So even though it's not yet this government, it is an important government and labor is very, very committed to keeping it. Now, it's not on the verge of breaking. Yes, there is a crisis. It's, but this is politics. It's Israel, if, it's a crisis. It's Israel, it's politics. It's, yes, of course. Um, I, had, I have to tell you, after all this, I don't know, very long period of, yes, Meshigas, then Israelis are addicted to the drama. You have to supply some drama every now and then. <laughs> Otherwise, they're bored. So I have to tell you, I was supposed to come yesterday morning to Los Angeles, but I postponed it in a day and I, because of the terror attack and because of what's happening with our politics, so I made sure to be in all the cabinet meetings that we had yesterday. We had a security cabinet meeting and the cabinet meeting and every um, Sunday, the cabinet meeting you know, was at 11. And before that, an hour prior to that, at 10 at the prime minister's office, we have a meeting of all the heads of the coalition. That is... To each of the heads of the parties. Yes, that means uh, seven men and myself. Um, You're used to that. Every week, it's a reminder of the way we still have to do, us women, you know, on the way to equality. Every Sunday morning, it's like the beginning of the week saying, okay. <laughs> so, but what I want to tell you about this specific meeting is that it was very clear that all the heads of the parties are in this together and everyone were focused on figuring out a way to come out of this crisis and keep the government going. Because this government is really working. It's really working for the State of Israel, for the citizens of the State of Israel. It's been a long time since we had a, a working government. So we will do everything in our powers to keep it and to keep it working. I mean, it's so interesting to hear you talk about it because, of course, when you joined the government, you acknowledged this is a right-wing government. This is a government Half. that does not, uh, it's not going to accomplish what I want right. on the big questions. And I was struck by a couple of quotes from an interview you did in December with the Times of Israel. They're short, so I'm going to read them. One thing you said was, fighting may be good politically, but it will achieve the opposite because I cannot win. Meaning, I think that, you know, you your labor positions do not have a majority in the cabinet or the Knesset. And then you also said, I'm very loud in cabinet, which I imagine you with the seven men. Um, I'm very loud in the cabinet, but outside there's no point in having the argument right now. So ah. I'd, love, I'd love you to say more about this strategy or these reflections, whether you think it's really worked over these months, how it's worked, and also, do you recommend this as a broader life philosophy for all of us? It's about closing ranks, I think. It's the same as I was doing as a member of uh, Knesset when I had, as a member of Labour, uh, when I had chairs whom I sometimes agreed with and sometimes I wasn't agreeing with, but I never criticized them outside the party because it would weaken the party. So again, if I want, if I'm, realizing that right now this government is the thing that Israel needs and it is the best option among the options that we have, then yes, I have to make sure that 
outside, it holds and it holds well. So I definitely am making my points within the government and fighting for the things you know, that are important for me. But I will not, I don't think there's, it's just, it's really non-constructive to do it outside. And it doesn't mean, like, for instance, one of the things that labor is fighting for is uh, we are fighting for the agriculture in Israel. So the um, treasurer wants to do this reform, which we think is destructive, so we wage the, the fight against it. It's OK. But it's not about um, bashing the partners. That's the difference, maybe. I mean, I suppose that's in one way, that's what the opposition does, right? Is you yes. spend your life fighting and shouting and da, da, and you were in the opposition? For and now nine you're not. years, and now you have to make the, the segue to, you know, being the government. I want to ask you about being the, being the only woman in that room. Um, long before you were a politician, you were one of Israel's leading feminists, um, speaking first of de-gendering the Hebrew language very famously. Um, and this is the most diverse Knesset and, ca and government in Israel's history and the largest representation of women, which I think brings it to 31st out of 33 democracies in terms of ranking on the representation of women. It's not generally doing well. So I wonder what you think you and other female ministers being in the government and having this slightly larger representation in the Knesset, how do you see that reverberating out into society um, in terms of gender equity more broadly in Israel? So first of all, in the Knesset, there isn't a big difference from the previous parliament, but in the government, it's a huge difference because we haven't had a government with more than four women ministers, and now we have nine. It's a third of the government. It's a huge difference. I think of the, first of all, you know, the, I think the most important difference is for women and girls to see potential models for themselves. So when they see a government that is, that is not, um, you know, like a group of men with four women, because we have 28 ministers, that's a lot. <laughs> so at least now it's a third, so it's, a, it's really a difference. And, and the same... And it's from many of the parties, right? I mean... No, first of all, one of the reasons why we have more women in the Knesset now is because when I was elected chair of labor, the first thing I declared was that it's going to be an egalitarian list in the zipper uh, system, that we are going to have one woman, one man, one woman, one man. And it was a week bef between my primaries and the primaries for the list. And we really did elect such a list. And since two of the members of Knesset became ministers and others came in, we have the first ever faction with a majority of women members of Knesset. It's amazing, five women and two men in the Knesset. It's like unheard of. That's, so I'm proud to have a part of that. But what I'm saying is that the, it, this is exactly the difference from the conversation that takes place when I am the only woman in the room. And a, an hour later in the government when a third of the participants are women. It's like all the difference in the world in the conversation, the language, the topics, the, you know, what gets more attention and more time. It makes a difference. And we have to make sure that we have more and more women in the places where decisions are being made, where the resources are being uh, allocated, because this is with, what is with the thing that will change reality. If we live, I mean, it's been a hundred years since women have gotten the formal equality in front of the law. And still, household work and child bringing are not calculated in the economy. How can that be? How can that be? It has to change. This and so many other things that men did not see as anything when they were alone making the decisions. So we have to have many more women on you know, the, the places where these decisions are being made. And it's the same here in America. It's not like, you know, I don't know, if no, we are 31, where are you? 
Uh, uh, not, I don't know. Not so. <laughs> this isn't about us. Not, not much higher. Let me tell no, you. Our rep yes, our rep <laughs> we have a female vice president, a new African American you. female on the Supreme Court. By all means, yeah. we're getting there. Um, no, I think that that juxtaposition you talk about about going from one in eight to thirty three percent, like in back to back meetings, is a really powerful metaphor. You should keep talking about that. That's okay. okay. Yeah, but um, not now, Jonathan. No, not now. Not we're going to go on to. We don't have. I, we're like holding these people back from dinner, so we're going <laughs> to wrap it up pretty quick. But um, a couple more questions. I want to go back to what you said uh, obliquely about the Palestinians, and you joined this government knowing that it was not going to advance the peace process, right. knowing that the leaders. Uh, did not agree with you about a two-state solution with the Palestinians, and you went ahead in hopes that you could block any further moves to make that dream even less possible than it looks. But many, many here, many people, you know, really deeply worry about whether it is at all possible, whether there's, um, they've given up hope for peace or for two states. They see that there's consensus emerging on both sides against it. They see there is not a Palestinian partner. They see there is no will for such an agreement among the Israeli right, which keeps prevailing sort of in elections. <laughs> they see the settlers, 600,000 settlers living in the West Bank. So do you honestly believe that two states are still possible and what could possibly bring it about? Listen. I am a third generation um, Holocaust wise. And I look at what's been happening in the Ukraine these days. And Israel has taken in um, about 20,000 refugees so far. And I am reminded every day how much a state for the Jewish people and the state of Israel is not something that we can afford to give up. And in order to maintain the state of Israel as the homeland for the Jewish people, we need to have a two-state solution. This is the Israeli interest. As an Israeli leader, I keep that in mind all the time. And I know that it is, given that it is my interest, then it's my business, to find a way to this solution. It is undoubtedly possible. It is possible because it is so dramatically required. And I am working on getting the political will to get there back in power in Israel. Because this is a linchpin to make it happen. But we have so many partners to this the US, our friends from the Abraham Accords, our older partners, Egypt and Jordan, Europe, everyone is willing to help make it happen. If you ask Israeli citizens where do they stand about the issues, regardless from political representation, you will see that there still is a small but a majority for the two-state solution. Of course, the majority doesn't believe it's achievable because if you look at what was happening for the last, I don't know, 25 years, they've only um, experienced failures. But that doesn't mean that it cannot happen. It is our interest that it will happen. And so it's my job to work until it happens. Thank you. Thank you. So part of your explanation in the beginning of who you are included that you're a mom of a seven and a half month old. No, not it was seven not and a an a description of who I am. It was a description of why a 15 hour flight <laughs> is a present. Okay. But you are a new mom. You yes. had a baby boy, Ori, uh, back last year, I guess seven months ago. Um, I was hoping we could get some pictures of him up on the big screen, but I guess we, I don't know if tech has anything, but anyway, I wanted to know how being a parent has changed your perspective on being a politician, on being a leader. Um, I was thinking about Ariel Sharon's famous line, what do you see from here that you didn't see from there? Wow, 
I'm embarrassed to say that it hasn't. First of all, that you, you know that as a feminist, I was so deeply engaged in, ev in all the issues that have to do with motherhood um, from a feminist point of view. I was, it's, it was so much uh, my business that none of what's happening ever since I have Ori living with me uh, surprising. I really knew what I was getting into. I know this, it's this very weird. Be, did someone record that? This must be the <laughs> first mom in history to say, nothing surprised me, I knew what I was getting into. I knew what I was getting into. I was, I was listen, I, the reason, it, as, I mean, it's, it was already written, I didn't want that. I knew what I was getting into. So by the time I already had Uri, I already made my peace with what it means. So, no, it wasn't surprising, it wasn't new, and it did not change my perspective. What I believe we need as a society, as women, as children, as men, by the way, men, you men have so much to gain from supporting feminism, um, <laughs> is the same. It's just the same. All right, thank you so much, Minister Michaeli. <laughs> it is great to see you. Thank you, everybody. I have no instructions on what I'm supposed to tell you to do now. I hope somebody's coming back to tell you. Yes, Dove is coming back. It's been great to be with you. Thank you very Enjoy much. Enjoy dinner. Here. It's great seeing you guys. Thank you, thank you, Jody. Thank you, Minister Michaeli. That was a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for being here this evening. I'm now happy to invite you all onto the terrace for dinner. Thank you.